Hunet Singh and Amaprit Singh are in a race to beat death. As they rush to deliver oxygen, a lifeline to people in desperate need around New Delhi. The two are part of Kulsa Aid, a nonprofit that's receiving much needed materials like medicine and oxygen concentrators from around the world and getting it into the hands of Indians who are suffering. Across the country, hospitals are beyond capacity and once crowded sidewalks now overflowing with makeshift clinics. The medical system has collapsed. People are not able to be saved. Even we spend money, even we spend our time, we will spend our all focus and energy. We are not able to save our patients. Overwhelmed medical staff and volunteers are working around the clock in 100 degree heat to save whatever lives they can. We are beyond capacity in our ICU. We have a 48 bed ICU, which we have stretched it to 56 beds, including the coronary care unit, because we have become a 100% COVID hospital. So we are. The need is maximum now. A dark cloud now looms over the country's capital. Crematoriums simply can't keep up, and bodies have begun washing up on the shores of India's holiest waters, the Ganges River. The virus claiming the lives of more than 4,000 people over each of the past two days. Over 400,000 new cases have been reported each day over the past week. But with testing scarce and many deaths going unreported, experts believe the number of those infected could be five to ten times higher. The World Health Organization has just designated this new, more contagious strain of the disease a variant of concern. New Delhi, the capital of the world's second most populous country, now a ghost town, the city under lockdown again. Here in New Delhi, we're in a total lockdown right now, but in some parts of the city, that looks like this. We're told this is actually a really quiet day in this neighborhood because when you have a city of nearly 22 million people, sometimes people living pretty much on top of other people, it's just impossible for everyone to stay six feet apart. We're on an urgent delivery run with Kulsa Aid right now. These oxygen concentrators are being dropped off to literally step in and save lives when the healthcare system has failed. And donations for this run is coming in from all over the world, from the UK, from China, from America. For Neha, this delivery is a sigh of relief. Her husband has been in need of oxygen for days. We approach so many leads, oxygen concentrator, but their phone numbers are unreachable or some are fake, so, but we reached uh, Hassan and we brought it today. I'm really very happy. At least I can save my husband's life. She's one of the lucky ones in a country where precious little seems to be going right these days. Blame for all that's going wrong is widespread. The fingers, it has to be pointed to the government first. They are the, they are the more like a parents and they cannot leave their children. The, it's, they cannot uh, abandon their children. Now it's all about the society who are standing for each other. It's all about the communities who are uh, sending each other for the other uh, the persons who are in uh, need. With resources scarce, people from all over have joined in to help. Newlyweds, Ashan Singh and Paramjot Kaur, say they sprung into action on day one of this crisis. Right now, we have found some sources from where we can get regular supplies, and we have also bought some concentrators, which people have donated us. The couple helping run a makeshift hospital created out of a wedding venue, getting oxygen to those in need. Day and night, we are open 24-7. We don't charge anything. People get free of cost over here. There are oxygen cylinders, concentrators. We give them food, we give them water, everything they need. The two aren't from Delhi, and they're not even medical professionals. They're tech workers from Punjab, almost 250 miles away. After getting married just a few months ago, they planned on a honeymoon. But with the death toll rising, they said instead they wanted to help. I and my husband were the first two volunteers of this drive through And uh, from the day one, we haven't uh, gone back to our home. It's okay. We are very happily like, staying here. We are just so satisfied that we are helping people. You've seen people die in front of you the past couple of weeks. What makes you keep coming back? It's the passion that I have inside me that came from my religion. I am a Sikh. I am born to die. <laughs> That's just a word that I use. And, you know, every breath that, that I'm taking right now is, is given by God. From our history, if I see, our gurus, our Sikhs have done for the people. They have just sacrificed their lives for the humanity. 
Paramjad and Ishan's sense of selfless service, called Siwa, is a defining tenet of the Sikh religion. Why is service so important to you? Our Guru has given us this, uh, this motto and aim. You, know, you, you just need to save the, save the people. That's it. Everyone is joining hand because uh, this is a need. This is a cause of con uh, country, so everyone needs to join the hands. We were in awe by the number of Sikhs we saw on the front lines. They make up less than 2% of the nation's population, but everywhere we went, we saw Sikh caregivers. Even Khalsa Aid, the nonprofit Puneet and Amapreet are working for, is run by Sikhs. What is it about the Sikh community? Why are we seeing this collective effort of service? I mean, why is it important to you to serve? We can help that. It's, it's like more like in our DNA. We have to send when there is some sort of situation, when you have to deal with such kind of situations, or when you have to feed the poor, when you have to uh, deal with the economic crisis, the poor, the, the Sikh community has always been there. Throughout India's modern history, the Hindu majority has frequently persecuted this community. Last year, millions of Sikhs had been front and center in what's been dubbed the largest protest in world history. Farmers descended on the capital to protest new laws they felt would hurt their ability to farm successfully. But when the most recent crisis hit, priorities changed and the Sikhs stepped up to help. There is a lot more uh, a drive to divide people on lines of religion and caste. Uh, but what this pandemic has at least shown is that people can rise above it very quickly. The pandemic is sometimes a, um, a great equalizer. Yeah, and I think the, the, what the pandemic should, people shouldn't forget in this pandemic is, to, is the kindness they have shown, is that they should continue to show that kindness. Chandiak lives in a posh neighborhood of Delhi. He stopped his law practice when things got bad and has been working to find the resources to build another desperately needed clinic. If you look back at history, whether there's been any sort of, uh, you know, oppression, injustice, uh, one of the first communities to stand up against it has been the Sikh community. And, and I'm very proud to consider myself to be a part of that. Across New Delhi, it seems as if every Gurdwara or Sikh house of worship has been transformed into an emergency room. Sarabjit Singh was just wrapping up the night shift here when we met him. He says he brought his grandmother to this free clinic to get oxygen three weeks ago, and then he stayed on to help. He hasn't been home or seen his four-month-old daughter since. So we try our best as in to save as much as we can, but that's, that, that's the best we can do that. At its worst, he tells us he saw a dozen people die every day, but it's the ones he's able to help that keep him going. People like Manu, her mother, by her side at the clinic. Manu says she was turned away from the hospital and had nowhere else to go. It was very scary because it was the middle of the night. Her mother's oxygen levels were dropping to below 50, and she was told to come here. And thankfully, her mom's been on oxygen since last night and is now appears to be stable. Three days later, Manu's mother's improving that makeshift clinic, possibly saving her life. Doctors here agree there's only one thing that will end this crisis. How vital are vaccines in getting not only India, but the world out of this crisis? I think that's the only solution, one of the only solutions at the moment. We don't have any choice. India is the world's largest vaccine maker, but when the country thought it had beat the deadly disease, it began distributing vaccines around the world. Now that it's raging at home, they're struggling to get enough doses. Just like India reached out to other countries in their vaccine diplomacy, other countries should also reach out to the, so the other underdeveloped countries which do not have the vaccine. Yeah. Because if the whole world is not vaccinated, it's going to affect the whole world. So in this crisis, every country has to heal, help each other. So maybe the developed countries should come forward and give vaccines also. Only about 3% of India's population has been fully vaccinated, nearly 10% with at least one dose. So you've been trying every day to get your yeah, vaccine. You haven't yeah, been able yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I apply for vaccine. I, every day I have to apply, but no space, no have like a vaccine. So many hospitals I have to be checking the max. And like a government, they're, new, have a, like a, they're totally booked. This lag in vaccinations here translates into a very real human toll. Many here blame India's government for what they say are catastrophic failures across the entire healthcare system. After a strict lockdown kept numbers low during the first wave, 
Prime Minister Modi was quick to declare victory. But with a predicted second wave on the horizon, critics accuse the government of not only failing to prepare for it, but of also tempting fate by encouraging mass gatherings, crowds of more than 15,000 people at religious ceremonies, cricket matches, and political rallies that are now believed to have fueled the new catastrophe. We also got our guards down. The first surge, we were able to handle fairly well, and um, so we didn't expect this. We knew that there would be a surge, but we never knew that it would be so rapid, so massive. And the government was in a celebratory mode, uh, you know, claiming to have vanquished the virus. There are reports that those critical of the government's response are being silenced. Their social media accounts allegedly shut down. And many people we spoke with were hesitant to speak about the government's response on camera. But it's the lingering smell and the dark cloud that continues to cover the city that will define the pandemic for this country. The grim sight of nonstop funeral pyres. These tires are normally out by nightfall, but right now there is just so much loss that they are burning 24-7 throughout the night. Hospital full, government and administration is fair. Delhi says you are quarantined in the home, but no facility in the home. They are crying and death at home. I think that Delhi is not dead, it is not dead, it is not dead. The fires, a constant reminder of the immense loss here, and with one estimate predicting one million Indians could die from COVID-19 by August. The need here is greater than ever. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.